Party White Flag. Happy Easter. Come on, how are you guys are excited to be here at Easter here at White Flag? Come on, let's give God some praise this morning. He has risen from the dead. So come on, we're going to lift our voices and sing. Let's go. Praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. Praise when I'm sure, and praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drowned in. Come on, we sing as long, as long as I'm breathing. I got a reason to praise. You can stay on your feet. You don't even need to sit down. I'm not going to talk that long. Welcome to all of our church family and welcome to all of our guests. We're so glad that you're here. Happy Easter. Uh, today we celebrate a risen Savior. Today, that's right. Today we celebrate that in Christ we're able to be made brand new. Now we don't have a show prepared for you. We're not here to entertain you. We are here for a purpose today. And so church family, your purpose is to worship with all of your energy and all of your strength and to be thankful to God for what he has done in your lives. 
That's what your job is to do. And guess, you have the opportunity today to come in and watch a room full of people who have been saved by grace and who want to worship their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're hoping that you'll see something in the lives of the people in this room that attract you to Jesus, because he can make all the difference in your life. And so I just want to officially welcome you all to Easter at White Flag. Welcome. the night wanting a place to hide this weary soul Oh
On this Easter Sunday, we have a ton to be excited about and a lot to celebrate. But here in this moment of communion, I want us to focus on one specific truth. And that is the truth that the reason why we gather as a body of believers every single week to worship Jesus is not because he was a man who died and stayed dead, but he was the perfect Savior who died to cover all sins. And on the third day, he rose again, defeating death, defeating sin, and defeating the grave once and for all. So church, as we celebrate, as we celebrate communion, let's not let this be a moment that is somber, but let it be a time of celebration. Let us celebrate all that the Lord has done, just like King David did in Psalm 24, where he writes, lift up your heads, O you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? He is the Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. It is because of our risen king of glory that we celebrate Easter, and it's because of our risen king of glory that we have a chance at new life. And so, in just a moment, I'm going to pray. And after I do, if you are a baptized believer, we invite you to participate in celebrating our risen King of glory, Jesus Christ, with us this morning through communion. And after I pray, our service host will pass out the elements of communion. And together, we will let this be a time of celebration, remembering Jesus' victory over death and the grave. So let's pray together. Father, we come to you this Easter morning just so grateful and so thankful that the stone was rolled away, that the tomb is empty, and that you stand in victory over every sin, every death, and everything that we could ever mess up, Lord. Your sacrifice was perfect, but wasn't enough that you would gave your life, but Jesus, you were victorious and rose again. So Father, we celebrate you, we give you the honor, and we give you the glory that only you are due. God, be in this moment with us, and we pray that you would just receive all of the honor that you would do and are due because of what you did through Jesus and are doing in our lives. So Father, we love you and we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Speak the name of Jesus over you In your hurt, in your sorrow I will ask my God to move I speak the name cause it's all that I can do In desperation I'll seek heaven And pray this for you I pray for you here circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that 
to bring to what happened today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I speak the name of all authority, declaring blessings every promise. I was lost. I was lost. I was lost. I was lost. I was afraid. I was broken. I was hopeless. 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 My relationships. My identity. My past. My past. My present. My future. My spirit was lost. Afraid. Broken and hopeless. But God, but God, but God, but God, but God, but God stepped into my life, stepped into my life. God stepped into brokenness, into my mess, into my addictions, into my friendships, my fear, my marriage, my trauma, my grief, my baggage. God stepped into my life. Stepped into my life. Stepped into my life. Stepped into my life. He spoke forgiveness into my past. Peace into my present. And hope into my future. God spoke courage into my fear. He spoke healing into my brokenness. He brought beauty from ashes. He brought life from death. I once was lost, but now I'm found, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see, but now I see, but now I see. I don't have all the answers. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but one thing I do know, hope has a name. Peace has a name. Forgiveness, justice, kindness, grace. Joy has a name. Love has a name. Life has a name. 
and his name is Jesus. 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 Jesus. And his name is Jesus. 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 And his name is Jesus. Good morning again and welcome to Easter at White Flag. What a day we've had already and we're just warming up. Have you been blessed by our time together already? Well... I'll tell you what, there are, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, creating this opportunity for you. And I just wish you knew how, how hard this worship team uh, and all the people behind the scenes have been working uh, to create not entertainment for you, not to be the focus of the day, but to create an environment where you can connect with Jesus. And I think they've done an incredible job. And the cool thing is they're not done. We've got a couple of more uh, songs and, and singing that we'll be doing after the message normally. I kind of just end things, but with Easter, uh, I preach a little bit short, and we do a little bit more worship, and so that will come a little bit later. But welcome, everyone, uh, to White Flag at Easter. It is an exciting day, and I want to jump right into things and read to you a scripture written by the Apostle Paul. It's found in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4. Here's what Paul writes. He says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. Now, Paul goes on to say that he then appeared to the twelve disciples and then to five hundred people. 500 people. This was not like they, you know, thought Jesus came back from the dead, that maybe Jesus didn't really die, maybe that he didn't really come back to life. No, everyone saw him die, and there were tons of eyewitnesses that saw him alive. And that's what we're here to celebrate today, that Jesus was resurrected and that his resurrection changes everything. It really changes everything. Paul wrote another letter to the young Christians in Ephesus 
And in that letter, he wrote this interesting line. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. He's writing to Christians saying, I hope you understand the hope that you have. And then he goes on to say, and to know the great power available to those who believe. And then he describes that power. He says that power is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. That's what Paul wanted his audiences to understand. And that's what I want you to understand today as well. That as Christians, we have hope. As Christians, we have power that's available to us. One of the most uh, unfortunate things that people do with the resurrection is this. They look back on it as an event in history that happened a long time ago, and they leave it there. They leave it there. They say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and yes, I believe he died on a cross, and yes, I believe he came back from the dead. It was amazing. But they leave it way back in history, and they they never recognize the impact that the resurrection that happened back then can have on their life right now, here, today. And let me just tell you, in the middle of your hectic, chaotic, crazy, jacked up, overstressed life, which I know one of those adjectives describes what you're going through right now, I want you to know that there is a hope available to you and a power made available to you by the resurrection. Now, our passage for study today, those were just warm ups from the Apostle Paul. Our actual passage that we're going to study today is just one verse. One verse. You might think to yourself, how in the world are you going to preach a sermon on just one verse? Trust me, I do it all the time. I can talk for an hour about one word, much less one verse. And so, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I think is just an incredible summary of what we're here today for. And Paul writes this one sentence, and here's what he writes. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, and the new has come. What does that really entail? What is really packed into that one verse, well, that's what we're going to go on a journey to discover today. And so, as we do every week here, uh, now that we've read this text, let's pray and ask God to fill us with truth and allow us to hear things that we've never heard or see things that we've never seen in the text so that we can be changed. And so let's pray to God now. Father, I just ask that you move in this place. We are so thankful to be able to have the freedom to come to this place this morning and worship you. Uh, We are so excited uh, for what you have done. And now we want to just learn more. We want to understand. We want your truth to be downloaded into our hearts. So will you uh, use me, speak through me, let it be your words, not mine today, and let, let your spirit move in this place and change lives. It's in your son's name that we pray. Everybody says, amen. Well, there are five concepts in this verse, so literally here's our map for the day. We're going to unpack five concepts from this one verse. They're right there for you to see. Uh, The first word we're going to look at is anyone. Then we're going to try to understand in Christ. And then the idea of a new creation. And then the concept of the old is gone. And we'll finish up with the new has come. What does all that really mean when you put it together? So the first word we're going to study is anyone. And this is a very important place to start. We need to see in this passage that no matter who you are or what you've done or how bad the thing that you've done is, anyone, anyone can receive grace from Jesus. The opportunity to be made new is for everyone. Anyone means anyone. Sometimes someone will tell you in a Bible verse, you know, see this word right here? Well, this verse doesn't, this word really doesn't mean what it says. You got to understand the background. No, anyone means anyone. Now, our duplicitous culture, 
uh, has an incredible way of pretending to believe that everybody is equal. Uh, and then they go about promoting ideology that divides everyone into categories and identities and skin color. And then they try to turn everybody on each other, right? Don't you love that about our culture? Uh, or are you sick of it like me? Amen? Yeah. Well, here's the cool thing. God doesn't do that. God, God truly sees us all as we truly are. He sees us all as equal. Not equal to him, but equal among ourselves. Everybody on the planet fits into the same category. Now, before you're like, yes, amen, which that's uh, kind of natural to say amen in our culture when we see all the divide that's created, but let me finish the concept. God truly sees us all as equally flawed, equally jacked up, equally dead in our sin, equally in need of a Savior. Everyone on planet Earth that's born on planet Earth is born into that reality. But the cool thing is, then he goes and offers grace to any sinner, no matter how bad, how disgusting, how depraved, how corrupt, if they're willing to place their faith in Jesus. If you're willing to place your faith and trust in Jesus, he offers you grace. And this applies to the worst of the worst. I don't know who you put in the category of the worst of the worst. Maybe it's Joe Biden. Maybe it's Donald Trump, right? I don't know which one you put where. Uh, maybe it's uh, Vladimir Putin. Maybe it's Zelensky for you. M maybe it's Dylan Mulvaney or Taylor Swift. I, I don't know who you think is the worst of the worst. I, I, I could, I, I don't know. I won't tell you. What, <laughs> I won't tell you. I won't tell you who makes my list, but, but here's the kicker. I'm trying to get you to think. Who do you think is the worst person in the world? Well, guess what? God offers them grace if they will turn and place their faith in Christ. Anyone. This is for anyone. And it's interesting. Some of you are not quick to go, oh, I can tell you who the worst of the worst is. And you don't want to put someone in that box. You, you place yourself in it. A lot of you would say, oh, man, I'm the worst of the worst. I, I, I would... I, I, I would you know, freak you out, Paul, if you knew what I thought and what I did and what my past looked like. And I, I, I'm the worst, and there's no way that, that God wants to, to forgive me of my sins. He, he, he wouldn't do that for me. And, and I'm telling you, uh, you need to be reminded that anyone is anyone. And in fact, the person that wrote this scripture that we're studying, the Apostle Paul, he considered himself the worst of the worst. He described himself as the chief of all sinners, and yet he received grace from Jesus. And so anyone is anyone. Now the next phrase I want to look at is in Christ. Anyone in Christ. This phrase is without a doubt the most important phrase, and it's the most important one for you and I to understand. It describes where we find grace, where we find forgiveness, where we find new life. It is in Christ. Christ. Paul describes it this way in another passage in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Now this is one of those verses, I'm going to read it once, and you're going to go, that sounds a little confusing, and then I'll read it twice in slow motion so you catch it. Paul writes, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, man, this is an important one. So let me read it to you again. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is what's known as the great exchange. It's this unbelievable transfer that Jesus offers us. Let me explain it in layman's terms. You give Jesus, what's yours? Your sin? And in response, he gives you what's his, his perfect righteousness. That's the exchange. You give to Jesus what's yours, what's all yours, what you did, all your sins. And in response, he gives to you what's his, his perfection. And you know what that accomplishes? When you stand before God on judgment day, you are seen as not guilty 
because God sees Jesus in you. And that is how you are in Christ. Now, don't get it confused. Um, the word in here, right, it's not referring to location like you are in this building. Uh, this is referring to your union relationship with Christ when you are in Christ. To be in Christ is to abide in him, to dwell in him, to live in him. And, and this is a, a metaphor that Jesus likes to describe, or this concept of the union with him. Uh, he has all kinds of metaphors to describe it. One of his more popular and easier to understand ones is the vine and its branches. He talks about how he's the vine and we are the branches. So a branch, and we understand this when we just look at plant life or trees or, or grapevines in, in nature, a branch receives all its nourishment and support from the vine. Like it literally is sustained entirely by being connected to the vine. And if you cut it off, it withers and dies. The branch does. And that's what Jesus is describing when we are in Christ. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches, all of our support, our strength comes from being in him. Now what allows you to be made new, this theme that we're talking about today, to be made new, well that comes from being in Christ. What allows you to live out your newness of life, well that comes from being in Christ. This is important for you to hear. There is nothing innately in you that allows you to pull either of those things off. There's nothing in you, despite what all the self-help books will tell you and all the ideology that says everything you need can be found within. You just gotta peel back the layers. But you have the ability to do this. No, you don't. You cannot save yourself from your sins. You cannot be good enough. You cannot make yourself become new. That can only happen in Christ. And when you place yourself in Christ, the reality is now Christ is in you, and that's how you're made new. In Christ, anyone, and now we get to this concept of a new creation. A new creation. Now, the phrase uh, new creation describes exactly what happens when we place ourselves in Christ. We become a new creation, and you'll notice on the graphic behind me that I chose a butterfly as, as the logo for the made new Easter graphic. And that's because when you look at a butterfly, you think of the concept of a metamorphosis, right? The bumper before the sermon had a caterpillar transforming into something completely brand new, a butterfly. And so when you're in Christ, I want you to understand it's not a tweak. It's not that you're a new and improved version of your old self. You are made completely new. Uh, the Greek word used for new is kainos. That's the Greek word in the original text. And that definition in the Greek of new describes that which has come into being and was not previously present. That, that's a little bit more than just, oh, new. It's kind of new, right? It's unlike anything previously known. So it's not like you're turning over a new leaf. You're beginning a whole new life. And here's what's so awesome is it's immediate. The moment you place your faith in Jesus, your status is changed. You're no longer corrupted by sin. You're no longer destined for hell. You have been made new. There, there's a, an author by the name of Arthur. That's hard to say real fast. So uh, Arthur Pink, he is a guy that lived back in the early 1900s. In fact, in 1918, uh, he was a theologian and a pastor, and he wrote a book called The Sovereignty of God. And uh, I, I don't even agree with everything that Arthur Pink uh, believes in theology-wise, but I love this passage in the book, The Sovereignty of God, that describes what happens when you become a new creation in Christ. And the reason I want to read to you a kind of a lengthy quote is because I just think we have lost the art of writing in our culture today. If you ever look back in time, like the Civil War diaries of people, I don't know if you've ever seen those documentaries where people are just writing casually in their diaries and they're like, 
who talks like this? They were so well spoken and they, they had just a way of describing things. And so sometimes when I go way back to the past, I, I like to read it and hear how someone will describe something that we kind of just say, well, this means that. And it's not nearly as cool. So let me quote to you from The Sovereignty of God. Arthur Pink writes, The new birth is a miracle. It's the result of the supernatural operation of God. It's radical, it's revolutionary, and it's lasting. When you become a new creation, several things happen. God lays hold of one who is spiritually dead and quickens him into the newness of life. God takes up one who was shaped in iniquity and conceived in sin and conforms him to the image of his son. God seizes the drudge of the devil and makes him members of the holy family. God picks up a destitute beggar and makes him a joint heir with Christ. God comes to one who is full of enmity against him and gives him a new heart that's full of love for him. God stoops to one who by nature is a rebel and works in him both to will and to do his good pleasures. God transforms a sinner into a saint, an enemy into his friend, and a drudge of the devil into his beloved child. I mean, that's not how we talk anymore. But it it perfectly describes what happens when we become a new creation poetically painting this picture of of completely being transformed in Christ into a new creation. So anyone, right, in Christ is a new creation. Now, uh, becoming a new creation happens on two levels, and this is kind of tricky but important for me to mention. It happens on two levels. I already mentioned that it's immediate, right? Your status changes when you put your faith in Christ, But it's also a lifelong process. We call this lifelong process sanctification. So those two things sound like the opposite. How can they both be true at the same time? Something is immediate and something is a process. Well, because it's supernatural, what's happening here? It is immediate and it is a lifelong process. It's immediate in an eternal sense, in a spiritual sense, The moment you place place your faith in Christ, he makes you new and determines your eternity, saves you from your sins. It's it's all fixed, but at the same time, you still live physically in this old body on this sinful planet. And so there's a process of he makes you new, but now you have to live in that newness. And so that's the process that's described in the final two statements we're going to look at. The old has gone and the new has come. That is true in an immediate sense, but it's also a process. And so let's take a look at the old has gone. This can be a little bit confusing because, again, after you've been made new in Christ, when you look in the mirror, guess what? You're still going to recognize the face that's looking back at you. You're still going to have the same nose. You're still going to have the same eyes. You're still going to maybe, unfortunately, have the same body. I don't know what you feel about yourself. You're like, oh, man, this is still here. That's how I feel when I look in the mirror. You're still going to have the same memories, the same DNA, the same personality. So how does the old go away? What is, how, how does that even really work? Well, it happens in two ways. First way, and I've already touched on this, the moment you put your faith in Christ, all of your old past and your sins and your mess ups and your mistakes are dealt with and they're put away and they're gone and that's what's so amazing about grace but in the second way you have to keep all of that junk away you got to keep the sin away you got to keep the old away would it make any sense to be made new to be transformed into a new creation only to then go back to all the old stuff that jacked up your life and invite it back into your life? Would that make any sense at all? Of course not. It wouldn't make any sense at all. And so this is where you play a role. You play a role. All your old thinking, all your old habits, all your old behaviors need to be put away. And the cool thing is you're not doing this all alone. 
You see, when you're in Christ, Christ is in you. And the Spirit is helping you keep all these old things old and gone and passed away. Paul says it this way. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but but Christ who lives in me. Maybe you've heard that phrase. That's what Paul's talking about. He's saying, I've been crucified with Christ. Christ died for me, and when I put myself in his life, uh, when I want to accept him and put my faith and trust in him, i got to die to myself, so I'm crucified with Christ. And then he makes me into a new creation. And now it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. This is Paul's way of saying, you know, I want my past to go away, and I need the help of Jesus to keep living in a new life for him and not going back to the old stuff. That's exactly what he is describing. So, here's the question. When all the old goes away, does that mean you never mess up again? You never sin again? Of course not. But it does mean that the whole direction of your life has been changed. Your attitude and your behavior is now bent towards not just living for yourself, but for honoring God. And we will never pull this process off perfectly because, as I've already said, while we're now free from the penalty of sin, we still live in a fallen world. We still live in the flesh. The difference is that in our old life, back in the day, before Christ, whatever we wanted to pursue, we pursued with whoever, however we wanted to do that. But now that we are in Christ, we fight and we resist sin We resist the old ways, and we walk in the new ways. Now, trust me, this is hard. This is not easy. But here's the cool thing. Listen to this. Because the work of salvation is done by the power of Christ, we can be confident that it's complete and perfect. Do you know what that means? That means the old you that sometimes you feel like you still are is no longer the version that God sees. He doesn't see the old you. When God looks at you, he now views you as in Christ and he sees you as perfect. That's a mind blower because uh, if you're like me, I I tend to lean into beating myself up a lot, not not being able to forgive myself when I repeat a mistake or I make a mistake and I think, "Ah, but I thought I'm in Christ and I've been made new, but then I do the stupid thing and then I sin. And I, I, I I wanna like, persecute myself, but I need to remind myself that if I place my faith in Christ, when God looks at me, he sees the resume of Jesus. He doesn't see my resume. He sees the resume of Jesus. That is incredibly good news. That's also what, that's what we call grace. Now, the old is gone, but the new has come. We've arrived at the last phrase. The new has come. God deals with the old first, but then he provides the new. In other words, he doesn't just remove bad things. He adds new things. He adds new things to our lives. And let me just tell you, man, oh man, are the new things good? In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 through 27, here's what's written. I will give you a new heart and put in a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This is in the Old Testament. This is a a God speaking to a prophet so that prophet can communicate something to the people of Israel thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. But guess what? This is a perfect description of exactly what God accomplishes through Jesus on the cross. When people put their faith in Christ. I don't know if you see the uh, similarities of what we've already been talking about. But again, in Ezekiel it says, I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. So new comes and then I'm going to remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'm going to put my spirit in you to move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my law. Right now, you don't care about me. Right now, you're not interested in me. Right now, you don't trust me. But, but when I put something new in you and take care of the old and get rid of it, I also give you my spirit to help you stay continuing to walk in the newness of your life. It's amazing that the Old Testament is so uh, good at describing what Jesus fulfills and completes in the New Testament. 
And so when you are in Christ, not only is the old dealt with, but the new that comes, you're given a new heart. You're given new desires. You're given a a new mindset, new perspective, new purpose. Like everything changes for you when you become a believer. Things that you never thought you would have interest in, 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 you begin to get interested in. Uh, Things that, that you used to love, you stop loving. It is a supernatural work by God that changes you. It's like he, he, he gives you this whole new arsenal of weapons to fight against the old nature and to fight against the world. He gives you all this new stuff, a new heart, new eyes. Well, you know what new eyes do for you? Well, they give you a new perspective, but, but new eyes give you the ability to see more and more and more and more new things and more and more and more truth. And it begins to give you discernment. And you begin to be able to navigate this life, avoiding the common pitfalls that the normal guy falls for. Uh, You you have a a new ability to see the temptations that are going to lead to destruction. God doesn't just take away the bad, but he deposits in you something new. And all of these new weapons, as I'm calling them, or uh, this new arsenal of tools is driven by the Holy Spirit that has been given to live in you, to direct you and guide you. You're not doing this all alone. All this new stuff is equipped and partnered with His Spirit living in you. So, I mean, if I were just to describe this one sentence, I could do it in one minute and give you some catchy little rhymy phrase to walk out of here, or we could unpack the Scripture, and that's what we've just done. We've taken one verse of the Bible and spent time unpacking what does anyone mean? What does in Christ mean? What does new creation, the old is gone, the new has come mean? What does that all mean? And I hope that as you look at it and you put it all together, you go, well, this is amazing. You see, there's two different types of people in this room. First of all, if you're a believer, which, you know, I wrote this message for you because Easter is a celebration for believers to come together and celebrate, celebrate Christ and the resurrection. I wanted to remind you of what the power of the resurrection has done in your life. Some of you are not tapping into that power. Some of you are not holding on to that hope. And even though you're a believer, you're in a hopeless position in your mind and in a powerless position. And that's just because you're not living in Christ like you know you're supposed to. I want to call you back to that. But then I also know in this room we've got a lot of visitors. This is just one of three services. Thursday night we had a record-breaking attendance. Right? We've never had that many people on a Thursday night ever. And I knew there were a lot of people new then. There's a lot of people new in this service. There'll be a lot of new people in the next service. And I don't know what the status of your relationship with God is, but I am required to mention something to you about this verse. I didn't mention it before, but now I want to mention it. And I'll just pull up the verse and there'll be one word underlined. And it's an important word for you. You see it? It's a big old if. And why is that word emphasized and underlined and italicized and in a different color? It's because if, if you have never trusted Jesus Christ with your life, if you've never called out to Jesus and said you're God I'm not I'm a sinner in need of a savior I want to make you the Lord and savior of my life if you've never done that then everything that I've talked about in this sermon and everything that I've described is not available to you it's not available to you you aren't new you don't have your past sins dealt with you don't become uh, you know, a new creation in Christ. You're, you're not going to experience any of these unbelievable things that I just talked about. It is only if you are in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, well, unfortunately, all your mistakes and all your sins you will maintain for all of eternity. And one day you'll stand before God and when he looks at you, he will not see Jesus because Jesus is not in you. And the only thing that there will be to see is all of the failures of your life, every single one of them. And you will be held to account. And then you will be placed in hell for all of eternity 
where you will live forever with regret that you didn't come to the conclusion that you needed to trust Christ with your life. I don't say that to scare you. A lot of people on, shoot, I've heard rumors that there's some churches in America that they don't want to talk about, you know, anything about the resurrection or about the blood of Jesus or the cross on Easter because they don't want to offend anybody. Really? Well, we're happy to offend you here, and we do it every week. (laughs) We really do. And so if it offends you to have someone look you dead in the eyes and say, I love you too much to let you blindly continue to walk down a path that will lead to your destruction, well then, you can hate me all you want. But I love you too much, and so I'm going to speak the truth to you. You need to come to the clarity that you are not God. And there is a God who sent his one and only son to live a perfect life, and to die on a cross and to come back from the dead and to offer new life to anyone who will place their faith and trust in him. That could be you today. We're not done with this service, but I am done with the sermon. I'm gonna just pray here in just a moment, but then we have uh, actually two more worship songs uh, that are gonna be amazing for us to go through together. This first song that they're gonna sing after I pray is is a description of everything that I just preached about. It's just in a song, written poetically. And if you're a believer, I want you to sing it at the top of your lungs. If you're not a believer, it's gonna be another message from the Lord of what's available to you today if you're willing to trust him with your life. And so I'm gonna ask you to stand up and uh, we're gonna sing this song uh, together. But first we're gonna pray. Father, we love you so much. We're so thankful for your truth and for your word. We now pray that you would move in this room as we continue to worship to remind believers how great you are and to introduce yourself to those who are seeking and investigating who you are. This whole day has been about you and it will continue to be about you. We are just so honored and privileged to be able to worship at your throne. It's in your son's name that we pray, amen.
is rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with all. Are you ready to be made new in Christ? That's the ultimate question, because if you are, now is your moment. I believe some of you have encountered Jesus today, and if you have, are you ready to respond to him? That's the question. Jesus died for you. He died for your sins. He offers you the opportunity of forgiveness and a brand new life. Here's what the scriptures say. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I hope that that's you today. I truly hope and pray that that's you. The next song that we do is the final song. It's going to be an invitation. And this is the song. If you're ready to be made new, you need to come forward. I'm going to be standing right down here. And I'd love to help you every step of the way. Let me tell you, we've got the baptismal pool ready. We've got people ready to help you. We've got towels ready, a change of clothes available, everything that you could possibly think of. That doesn't need to be your focus. The focus should be, are you ready to start a brand new life in Christ today? You know, on Thursday night, 10 people came forward, gave their life to Christ, and were baptized. Right now, there's already one, one person that came, and they're ready, and they just, they, they came early, and they're ready to go right now. And, and I believe there are some ready today in this room to make that decision as well. And so don't put this decision off. D don't make this as an emotional decision. Make this as a absolute reality of your life that you've concluded, I am not God and I want God to actually rule my life. If that's where you're at today, I'd love to help you every step of the way. So if you're ready, come be made new. I'll meet you right down here. I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus. Well, I believe in the crucifixion. Let's sing. I believe in the crucifixion. By his blood, I have been set free. Church, we sing. 
to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mind. could be you in this room today. You could have been wrestling with God coming in here, could have been wrestling, wrestling with faith, but I would just pray and I would hope for you that you just stop wrestling God. He loves you. He wants to meet you. And this is your moment. This is your opportunity to step away from today and be able to say this boldly. I will never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it has changed my life. So today, church, we're going to sing this and believe it. So let's lift our voices together. No, I'll never. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Come on. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel. dismissed but if you want to continue to make decisions we have our pastor down here also outside here you guys can watch people continue to get baptized we've seen so many people come forward and accept jesus so i hope you guys have a great easter with your family we will see you guys next time
But a lot of time wasted I choose you You're what's missing I choose you Now I'm different Everyone's saying that I'm crazy Good thing they're not God who made me So let them talk
was lost I was asleep at the wheel I was drifting off My heart was failing My heart was failing In the dark Heard a song It was the sweetest sound that I've ever heard 